so I'll just say again, so this this theme, I've, I've made it my theme of the year. And I've been several times in the United States. So some people from there will already know about this story. <laughs> um, I've also been in Quito and Sao Paulo. And next week, I, I kind of finish this um, year's work in Ireland. Um, but you can see from that that my main uh, stamping ground is North, South and uh, Central America. And um, <clears throat> I'll say more about that later. But much of the background to what I want to share, you can find it on hopespringseternal.world. And hopefully in the chat, there's a list of various references, which I won't mention, but um, they are the references linked to the talk. So if you want to look at them in the chat later, they're all there. Um, my theme has varied, uh, has a varied genesis. And in part, it, it, it comes out of my long involvement or destiny with the Americas, which so far has been for, I think I first became involved in when I was 15. So it's 60 years of my life I've been involved in the Americas, North and South in different ways. Um, so I have a long history there. Um, a second part is my involvement in the Anthroposophical Society and Treasury Matters in those parts of the world. And then I've also been there uh, in more recent years in my role as, as the convener of the Economics Conference of the Gertianum, visiting colleagues and projects. Uh, I also have a kind of formal academic um, link through my um, central banking work and primarily to uh, Brazil, that would be. So I and um, lastly, I have a long political involvement in especially Latin America since my student days. So I have a pretty good sense of all those countries. Um, and I'm saying this to, to kind of own that my, my, I had this strange link to the Western Hemisphere. Um, and that's kind of where I'm speaking from. I'm actually English and I live in Folkestone in England. I look across to France, um, but a lot of my life is linked to the Americas. Um, but this theme, also arises from uh, my experience as an economic and monetary store in my professional life, um, but also my long engagement with the Anthroposophical Society since um, I think 1972. Um, now I want to sh I want to say various things and share some sketches, um, and I want to make clear though that they are a kind of they're a synthesis of ideas I've had but also presented in different contexts. And um, they, they may not, they may, may look like my, my images, but actually they've often been changed because of the response or the working on these images. So, so far they're a synthesis of many, many meetings. <coughs> and, <clears throat> and this evening, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they may well have to change because of any discussion we had this evening. So I don't want you to think they are descriptions of how things are for sure. It's just where I've got to so far in my journey. And one thing has become clear to me when we talk about the Anthroposophical Society in the way I wish to this evening, a lot of people have found a way of renewing their interest in the society. And uh, it's been quite um, not just welcome, but uh, I think at this point in time, it's quite important to see that people who've become disenchanted or even distant from the society, I don't mean anthroposophy, I mean the society, um, through this kind of imagery and these discussions, they kind of reawaken their interest and become more engaged. And I think it's important to say that in advance because from my point of view, the whole of humanity sort of is about to rush through the eye of a needle and you only get to do that once. Um, and I think the role of the Anthroposophical Society is, is sort of critical in achieving that um, historical task we have in front of us. So I wanted to place the Anthroposophical Society full square in the past of history, as it were, and looking at, again, as I said, as an historical event. <clears throat> I've organized my talk under six topics. <coughs> The evolution of economic life, a second chance for humanity, the story of country groups, an old story with a new telling about the branches, we become what we think, 
and owning the Goetheanum. These obscure references will, will hopefully become clear as I go along. So concerning the evolution of economic life, um, I want to share an image. This is all going to be very clunky. So I'm going to share a screen and someone needs to tell me if it doesn't work. Uh, okay. Share screen. Okay. Can you see a lovely drawing? Someone say yes. Yes, can. Okay. So this is this is a sketch that I <clears throat> that tries to show where we are. I mean where we are is nineteen twenty-three plus one hundred years. So <clears throat> we're right off the um, screen, in fact, over here somewhere. Um but I'm I'm focusing on nineteen twenty-three because I think that was the first chance of humanity <laughs> the first chance humanity had to create a kind of society in its own image of itself, meaning in anthroposophical terms, we're now in a particular Michael age. And this kind of Michael age hasn't happened before because the gods have now left us on our own. And what we make of the world is, is up to us. So I think it's very important historically to sense 1923 is a, a huge moment in human history. And it's the first chance we had to create a social life um, based on a single world economy, nested in the peoples of the world, each one of which required to be recognized in its own right. This is my very English way of saying the threefold social order. <laughs> but I'm putting it in those terms because I'm speaking as a historian. And I think it's very important that we take the view how does the world at large see the threefold social order with which we are so familiar, but they are not? So often I try and express that in just in, in more poetic English than with sociological precision, you might say. But in 1923, this is our first chance to design and build a society of our own making and in our own understanding of humanity. I think if we look 100 years on, it's pretty clear we've made a fist of it so far. But I don't think that means we can't do better. And um, as some of uh, you know who are looking in here, I'm a believer in the second chance theory, meaning in 2023, humanity gets a second chance to do what it should have done in 1923. And I, I, as a historian, I take that very Seriously, I don't mean, you know, 100 years later, everything would be fine. I just think in this particular case, humanity has a second chance. Um, and it's a bit like in modern days, you can build the most awful buildings. Uh, and you don't really ha realize how awful they are until you've built them. And then you tear them down and you would never build such a building again. That may sound trite and trivial, but I think that's part of humanity's journey at this very early point of being in charge of our own destiny, we're going to, we're going to make a mistake. Um, but then we get a second chance. And I think that's where we are now. And if I just back up a bit to the, the, what brought us to this point, this is an image. Um, it's an image, my image of Rudolf Steiner's thesis in economic history, but it's, I tested this professionally. So, so it's a very useful image. It shows the, the value of Rudolf Steiner's insights, <laughs> but it's not peculiar to him once you get the point. And um, I'm gonna just go through it very briefly. <clears throat> Excuse my coughing all the time. If you go back to the ninth century in Europe, that is, you have all these little um, small economies. They're sort of fiefdoms or manors or lords with their estates and their peasants and their armies and they were all independent and separate from one another but um, economically speaking uh, an independent uh, entity like this one here will always generate a surplus and that will cause it to link up or find a relationship with other seemingly independent economies and this is the starting thesis of i think what Steiner says is certainly how i understand history even though we're independent in the ninth century, trade and the surpluses that created through trade will cause these 
um, unit units to start to have a conversation. Um, and then that process continues. And so when you come to 1648, this is a great, very crucial date in European history. This is the beginning of nation states as we know them, or as we come to know them. And in this image, this, these five little ones are inside this one. So this might now be France with all these little principalities. This might be, I don't know where that might be, Austria with lots of principalities. This might be Spain. But the image I'm trying to give you is we now have economically speaking, nation states are the vehicles of economic development, but they still also create trade and surpluses. And so they are heading to another situation, um, which Stanley describes coming around, particularly in the 19th century, of a proto-global economy in which these, these nations with their little pieces inside them are now part of a single world economy. And um, particularly important in the 19th century, this one then could be Germany, unified, it was the last nation unified uh, into a nation. And that happened in the 19th century. And so we arrive at the end of the 19th century uh, with this situation, but the dynamic of creating a surplus remains. And I think this is crucial to see that in a single world economy, we are still trading with one another. We're still generating a surplus, as it were. But with whom do we trade? Where is this dynamic going to go? And it clearly, unless Elon Musk is, is successful and successful in a hurry, um, we have no one to trade with. And one of Stein's most important theses is that all kind of implodes in on itself. And for example, he talks about how balance of payments between countries and the gold um the gold species theory of balancing trade by moving gold all that disappears gold becomes irrelevant the balance of payments actually becomes kind of the three kinds of money and i won't go into any more detail than that but it's a very simple and i think effective way of understanding economic evolution <laughs> and it has in it a particular particular problem that standard talks about when you come to the end of the 19th century, the modality of economic life has become nation states. <laughs> In fact, if you've ever seen pictures of the 19th century, they may be nation states, but they all call themselves em empires and they all have emperors and they all walk around with ostrich feathers on their head. And they're all part of the royal families of Europe. So although they're nations, they call themselves empires. And this creates a huge problem. When you have a single global economy, what happens to your, your nationhood? How do you identify it? And what I, what I want to show in this picture here, hopefully, is the solution, not just the solution from Steiner's point of view, but the way economic historians also understand it, if they pay attention to the details. That a lot of economic historians have no interest in understanding this because in the background, Britain loses all its power. And so it's very important to make a distinction between what happened with Britain <clears throat> when it refused to lose its power, which is the last 100 years. <clears throat> you can look at Gaza and see that very exactly, how Britain is hanging on to a certain image of itself and is the cause of many modern problems. But in this image here, I want to try and show how you have a, a single world economy here in the center, surrounded by nations, which are all independent of each other. And each one of those has a star, has a kind of role in human history, which is unique to itself. That's my image. And you can find this in many ways expressed, and let's say not just by Steiner, it's a sort of, it's the latent situation we find ourselves in. It's just overlain by the chaos of the last 100 years. And so part of the second chance thesis is that we can, we can um, make this story visible again and give it a second, um, uh, you know, put air under its wings for a second time. So I hope that's, that's kind of understandable. Um, we can come back to it uh, later when we need to. Um, if I, I just leave it there and, and carry on.
So this second chance story, <clears throat> I think it's very important that we take this seriously. And one way of making it super serious is if I say we've had a first chance, we now have a second chance. It's not certain we will achieve it, but there will not be a third chance. So it's kind of now or never, which is quite a dramatic thing to say <clears throat> about history. And um, never is a very strong word to say. So the crucial thing is when I say it's now or never, how long is now? And here I want to say a strange thing as a historian. Um, there, are kind of, there can be big events in history, but there can be quiet ones which you don't see happening. But the big event relies on those quiet ones having happened. I could give an example of, of uh, the mystery of Golgotha, if you see what I mean. That was a quiet event in the way I'm speaking. It happened. Very few people have understood it even today. But one day they'll wake up because it happened. So I'm using a strange image because I think the, if you look out in the world today, where do you start um, picking all the problems and getting anywhere near this image that I'm claiming from 1923? It's almost impossible, but I think you have to start with somewhere where you can get traction and you create your own little world. And if that's successful, then the future of humanity or a future humanity will sort of access it and wake up because of it. Meaning if we didn't do something now, <clears throat> we stymie the rest of history. So I'm not talking about any huge event or any immediate event. The now in my mind is actually quite a long now um but for the small event we don't have a lot of time the small event is the anthroposophical society <clears throat> um i just want to um say from the world's point of view from the point of view of economic history um that already in in uh, 1908 you can come back to the end of the 19th century here and there's a problem growing up um how do these nations uh, behave towards one another when they now have one economy in which they find themselves and they're not sovereign in their own economies. This is a crucial issue and it still is a crucial issue. We still have not freed the world economy from nationality, from nationalism and from national economic thinking. But in 1908, um, I'll just give one example. A British economist, Roger Hawtrey, he said the following, if all countries maintained internal price stability, both economies and exchange rates would be stable without the need for contractual transfers. In 1953, Milton Friedman, who you might be surprised to hear me referencing, <laughs> he went on to say, but it's already 45 years later, that flexible exchange rates are a means of combining interdependence among countries through trade with a maximum of internal monetary independence. They are a means of permitting each country to seek for monetary stability according to its own light, without either imposing its mistakes on its neighbors or having their mistakes imposed on it. And this is where my own light's story comes from, actually comes from Milton Friedman, who somehow has this strange image or, or fascinating image that when we get into world economy, everything depends on every nation <clears throat> um, finding its own identity in order then to share the world economy. It's strange for him to be saying this, but I think it's very important. <clears throat> um, and that's where I get the whole idea of own lights from. It comes out of uh, economic history. But more importantly for me, in, in 1923, uh, John Maynard Keynes talked about this a lot, and this is the time when he was, in my mind, back to back with Rudolf Steiner. You had, you had, I'm looking at myself in this, you had um, Rudolf Steiner on one side in Europe, on the mainland of Europe, as it were, and Keynes over here, and they could have met, but they never did. Steiner was often in London in 22, 3, and 4, and at the same time as uh, Keynes, but they never met. And yet, if you put them back to back, if you read Steiner's economics lectures and if you read Keynes' track on monetary reform, you can really have the image these two people belong together somehow. And so I'm mentioning Keynes because he also 
built this, he wrote this book, Tracked on Monetary Reform, where he was also trying to understand how do separate economies, separate so-called national economies, how do they start to work together where they don't lose their national identity, but they nevertheless can cooperate economically. This, in fact, was uh, Keynes' whole, what I call his unspoken mission. And this you can find very clearly um, described or, or uh, um, documented by his biographer, Robert Skidelsky. Um, <clears throat> I know these uh, very, it's very technical language I've used and it's boring and it's dry, but it's important, I think, to have a sense. This is how macroeconomic historians look at the world today. This is still the central problem they're trying to understand. And <clears throat> one thing I want to share is I think one has to be very careful um, not to say if one's familiar with Rudolf Steiner's work, well, it's obvious Steiner told you that a long time ago. You just need to listen to Steiner and adopt his ideas and you will solve your problem. This isn't the way I think the world's going to go. Um, I think Rudolf Steiner's contribution has to be proven in, in quite a different way. And, <clears throat> and strange to say, I think this whole big macroeconomic problem that we face uh, can be described from the, quite the other side. It, it comes down to how, how do you fund a free spiritual life? And I think in generic terms or overall terms, when Steiner talks about threefold social order and the three spheres of, of economics and cultural life and um, rights life, um, his point is often, it's not just about cultural or spiritual life, it's about a free spiritual life. How do you, how do you undertake something? It could just be an initiative or a particular ethos you want to follow. How do you undertake that in such a way that when you finance it, when you start creating relationships with it, those finances and those relationships do not unstitch what it is you're trying to do or do not compromise it. And a key part for me there is how do you fund free activity, free initiative or free spiritual life? It's, it's a kind of, um, if you take the big whole threefold story and put it into a nutshell, it will come down to that story. How does someone take an initiative in today's world in such a way that when it's funded, especially by others, their initiative is being hallowed. They're not suddenly having to do what the provider of the money wants them to do. To me, this is a very concrete form of funding a free spiritual life. We can, we can put that in more specific cases. So we can talk about the Anthroposophical Society as an example of that. But my concern is often when we talk about the Anthroposophical Society, we forget that it's an example of something. We're so inside it that we that we forget to look at ourselves from a historical point of view or from the the example we could be of a much more generic problem or a generic solution. And that, <clears throat> as I said before, is what I'm really trying want to look at this evening. How does the Anthrosoft Society look uh, when seen in light of this huge economic historical problem? And does it have a contribution to make to solve that problem? Now, if you're still with me, I want to go to a second slide. Uh, something's in my way. Uh, okay. So this this is uh, my second or my next topic, my third topic: the story of country groups. And um, <clears throat> this is very um, what's the word? <clears throat> cryptic but there's lots of information in here which you may not know about or there's lots of information here which you might want to challenge me about i'm very open to that and for me that's part of the point of the presentation but it's my it's my attempt to show a, a, what i feel is a very important history um uh, that here on the left this this one on the top left is supposed to be blue and the rest are black in my understanding, this is this one up here was the original Anthroposophical Society founded in Germany, but not uh, not the German society in, I think, 1912. And along the way, leading up to 1923, 14 other societies were founded. <clears throat> As I say, we can go into the details of that later, but the, the image I want to share there is the original one here is in blue and 14 more 
autonomous societies were established before the Christmas conference. And then the Christmas conference is this is image here, the Anthroposophical Society founded or refounded in Christmas 23 was kind of born out of these societies. Here's the blue one, supposed to be blue. This is the German society. And at this point, they kind of became groups of the society. I know that they're also independent societies in a more juridical sense. But in this image, I'm deliberately calling them groups of this overall society, the worldwide society. And I'm meaning the one whose statutes were iterated in the book about the proceedings. So um, what I'm wanting to say here is this image is very, is not so different uh, to this image. And I'm not just trying to be clever. I think it's the case that this is a kind of macro historical version of the same problem. Meaning in the case of the Amposoft Society with its groups after 1923, this is the way that the Amposoft movement or the society at least can accomplish this historical task on which the rest of humanity can then rely. So this is a huge statement on my part. And I hope you're clear what I mean by it. And then if I go back to, to this one, uh, because I'm de deliberately linking these, here, 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 here in this sense is the Anthroposophical Society with its groups. And here in my image <clears throat> is the own lights of these groups. But I'm asking the question, what is the own light of an Anthroposophical Society? And my question there is, is this not something to do with the folk souls? Again, we can have a detailed discussion about this, but in my mind, behind each country group is in some way a folk soul. And this is a way also of describing the own lights. What would the own light of a country in fact be if it wasn't some kind of folk soul? It's a nice idea that Milton Friedman has that the country has its own lights, but he doesn't dis decide what that is. <clears throat> and I'm suggesting in this conversation that the own light of a country, if you get into it, if you really ask um, what is a country like um, Brazil, when you take out all the external manipulation by the British and the Americans and the Portuguese, what is the purpose of Brazil? What, did it, what can it claim as unique about itself? This must be some kind of folk soul question. I'm not going to go that in detail. I'm just um, putting that on the table at this point. Are the country societies of the Anthroposophic Society linked to the folk souls? And so again, is this the way in which the own lights of humanity generally is going to get traction? This whole idea. <clears throat> um, I also want to say something quite uh, specific hopefully controversial, um, because it's part of our situation and it's part of understanding the world's problem. Um, what I want to say is that even though most of humanity is pretty much asleep to all the issues I keep talking about, I can't believe that everyone's asleep. And therefore, one of my questions is how do we find the people who are not asleep and, and what will wake them up even more? My image is somehow that they kind of, they just kind of open their eyes. They're trying to find something, but the thing they're trying to find, which will keep them awake, is not shining clearly. That thing, of course, is the Anthroposophical Society. <laughs> so um, I want to say something uh, about this story here, about which is the same as this story. How, how do the nations come free of their economic um, entanglements? And um, I wanted to, to quote something from Keats, John Keats, the poet. I'm, I'm taking this from a video I saw the other day with Eugene, Eugene Schwartz, which Andre organized, I think. It's a poem by John Keats when he was 21. Great spirits now on earth are sojourning. He of the cloud, the cataract, the lake, who on Helvellyn summit wife awake, catches his freshness from archangel's wing. He of the rose, the violet, the spring, the social smile, the chain for freedom's sake, 
and lo, whose steadfastness would never take a meaner sound than Raphael's whispering. And other spirits there are standing apart upon the forehead of the age to come. These, these will give the world another heart and other pulses. Hear ye not the hum of mighty workings? Listen a while, ye nations, and be dumb. This was Ke Keats. He died when he was 27. Um, but that poem was written in 1916, which is precisely the moment when Steiner describes the beginning of the what he calls the money market separating from the goods markets, the whole process whereby the financial economy tries to kind of separate from the real economy, leading all the way through the 19th century um, up until really 2008. And I just wanted to read Keats because the problem of nations was already known then. Um, and he, in his poetry, he links it. It has something to do with listening to the archangels, catching afresh the archangel's wing. And so for me, if I go into the poetry, uh, I think one finds kind of evidence of this story. This has something to do with folk souls, whatever we mean by folk souls. And if we can find a way for modern economics to have an image of that or accept some kind of guidance from that idea, then I think we can um, achieve what I'm trying to talk about. Now, this problem has been a long time in the making, meaning at least uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. And one can wonder why in 2023, one is, hasn't solved it or whether it's even solvable. But I'm an eternal optimist. And um, I think this whole idea that in 2023, you can see the world falling apart in lots of different ways, primarily because the possibility we had in 1923 is re reappearing again. You can do it in a negative sense. The fact that we didn't understand it, we run out of road for all the things we built instead. And so we're back at square one. But you can also see the other way around. This possibility is actually um, re-energizing -en itself, wanting to happen a second time. <laughs> and it's breaking away or making invalid all the things that have been constructed since. It wants, it wants to happen. And again, for me, um, what I'm trying to say here is that then depends on whether the Amposoft Society understands itself not as a private event, but as a historical event and with a historical task, especially at this point in time. So the fourth thing I want to say in this strange story is if we look again at this, I hope I'm still, am I still screen sharing? Andre, are you looking at my screen? Yes, it's it's visible, Christopher. Okay, thanks. Um, if 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 you go back to this one, um, this one up here, which is supposedly blue, is uh, this one here is the German German group of the Amstelsen Society. Now, this one over here is another country society, and and I want you to follow this line. So here we are, the Amstelsen Society at the Goetheanum. Here's the country society, and down here. Um, it's the same story. And now in this country society, um, the image I'm using is, hopefully you can see it's the same one. It's the same uh, own like story, now replicated uh, at the level of a country group or a country society. This one has nine branches. That's what these little blue circles are. And my reason for trying to sketch it this way is to, is to keep reiterating this same own light thesis or theorem uh, is historical. It's not outside the Amposoft Society. It's inside the Amposoft Society. And the Amposoft Society is kind of can be understood in its light, meaning if we can work it out on a so-called micro level, it will have a macro consequence. That's my strange story. And what I want to say about this is that um, when I think about the society in Dornach here, for example, and a country society over there, <clears throat> I never think really in terms of the center and the periphery. For me, the image that I have more and which I'm trying to show here is the whole and its parts, and every part replicates the whole. And I think this is important because then 
the dynamics that exist here between Anthroposophic Society and its country groups can be experienced inside a country group in re relationship to its branches. And that means you can have a dynamic experience much closer to home. <clears throat> and in my experience of doing seminars about this, the, the whole notion of the Gertianum over there starts to disappear because my imagery is actually just a replication of the same story. So <clears throat> I'm saying this fairly quickly, but this is a very simple image of how, at least in the United States, I've been looking with some colleagues there at how the branches of the United the Anthroposophic Society in the United States uh, can re-understand itself. That's a huge topic, but I think it's very general. If you go into Argentina, other places, Mexico, they also have a, a national, well, not Mexico, but Argentina has a national society and it has branches, but they can't quite find their right relationship. Mexico has a number of branches, four or five, but it doesn't yet have a country society. And when you start to look into these issues, I think this image has a kind of universe, a universality. And that's why I'm pushing it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not pushing absolutely, but I think the Anthroposophical Society worldwide is in a state of, um, do I say confusion or conflicting images about itself. And one of them I think is it doesn't have a clear image of the branches. Again, that's a topic we can discuss, but I, I put it here very forcefully to show this is the own like thesis now down on the level of a country society and its branches. So I'm drilling down into the actual life of the Anthroposophical Society, trying to find the point at which we can get traction for this huge world problem I have in the back of my mind. Now, a couple of um, sort of uh, epistemological things. Um, in my journey, which is quite a long one with the Anthroposophical Movement, um, Two things have always been clear to me. Uh, one is you have to be really engaged in the society. You can't marginalize or think it's not important. Um, at, at some point you have to join the society, not because it's a club, be, but because it's, it's a way you can say you're now taking anthroposophy seriously as a reference. In, in Steiner's image, when you join the society, you're not responsible for anything about anthroposophy, you're just, sort of owning the fact that it's now an important reference for you. And I would say, unless you meet up with other such people, you're you're not that you're lamed, but the, the full benefit of having discovered anthroposophy uh, can't be developed. But you do not take any responsibility for anthroposophy when you join the society. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but it means for me, for example, the, the many people who, who take anthroposophy as a reference, like Waldorf teachers or biodynamic farmers or whatever we've described, when they have no link to society, I feel there's a huge problem. And the problem is usually the perception we have of society. So in this whole discussion, I'm also trying to clarify an image of the society, which teachers and farmers and anybody who takes their reference from anthroposophy, only their reference. Um, could then see the society as something to which they need to have a link, not something to which they have no connection, or worse, that they kind of turn their back on and wish it wasn't there. In my mind, we need a much more proactive understanding and link to the anthroposophical society, if we take anthroposophy seriously. Um, that's not the same as taking responsibility for it, which in my understanding, that, that would take you into the school of spiritual science, but I'm not even talking about that at this point. I'm just talking about the it's kind of a piece of spiritual pragmatism. If you discover anthroposophy or any movement, you need to find the people who are of like mind. It's some kind of soul law. And not to do that will lend you in your um, further work, which I'm convinced about. So I've never had that problem, so to speak, because I've always engaged myself in the society. That, though, brings lots of other problems. And the main problem that my experience is, is the way the Anthroposophical Society is financed um, is a matter of great grief and complication. So my second epistemology has always been to try and understand 
the way the society is financed, the way something to do with the free spiritual life is funded, and the way Rudolf Steiner would go about that. I don't want to speak about that uh, tonight in any detail, but just to say that's always been part of my life. Hence, I'm a treasurer. <laughs> Hence, I'm very active in trying to figure out a chart of accounts for the Anthosophical Society, because the Anthosophical Society, seen generically, is an earthly vehicle which carries a kind of intangible thing, in this case, the School of Spiritual Science. But this is true of many spiritual uh, organizations. They, are, they have an earthly body which is trying to carry an ethos, uh, and the trick is the ethos is not dragged down into the earthly world. So the, the, the whole construct of the Amposoft Society and the School of Spiritual Society, society Science has huge generic meaning for the world. It's important in itself, but once that's clear, it can be replicated by anybody who wants to carry some kind of mission without that mission being compromised, contradicted, or outright broken by the way it's resourced. And so for me, it's you can't get there unless you at least engage in the way it's financed and you engage in the way uh, you think um, Ruta Sina would do the financing. So for me, I want to make this a second, it's, it's a huge piece of methodology because in this today's world, you can have all sorts of spiritual goals and intentions and ideals, but if you're not grounded in finance, both conventional finance and Rudolf Steiner's understanding of it, these ideals and goals can just float around in the heavens and never be achieved. And I think a great deal of what we see in our movement and in the world is linked to the lack of grounding in finance we end up with a lot of what we would call luciferic hopes, um, which wouldn't be there if we grounded in finance what we're trying to achieve. And so the last thing I want to say um, is something which for me has been very important in sharing these ideas with lots of different groups in, um, as I say, in the United States in particular, this last five, six months, but in, in um, Latin America also, that um, the, the, you can go from a place of disbelief in the Amposoft Society or distance from it or uh, unpleasant comments about the Goetheon and being over there, all this sort of language starts up because fe people feel quite dis distant, disengaged, um, not relevant. But in my experience, especially if one tries to work with the idea that a country group is, is but another version of a larger group and all these dynamics are visible on a local level, then my experience is people start to wake up. The, the lang language ceases to be the Gertianum over there because they start to experience the Gertianum is wherever they take this work seriously, not just recognizing the Anthroposophical Society and wanting a link to it and thinking particularly of institutions. Um, but also then taking a kind of further step. So how, how would I take responsibility for the for anthroposophy? And <clears throat> I just want to say this lightly, but it's been very interesting to see. People start to wake up that they then also need to have some other understanding of the school of spiritual science. And they also come into the question, how does that work in terms of finance and juridical entities? I'm just saying this because my experience is these complicated topics become tractable. We can get hold of them. And I've seen people go from a kind of, um, I won't say dislike, but what's the point of the Amposoft Society in the school to, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of this thing. And now I can take ownership of the Gertianum. That's my sixth and last topic. How do people take ownership of the Gertianum in the sense um, you say people want ownership of a brand. They want to feel that their inner, inner identity is linked to the Gertianum. For me, this is quite crucial because once people have this link, then it plays out in their whole financing. Then the, the society becomes something which is absolutely relevant and necessary, but also the financing of it. And so then we're taken into a kind of um, will sphere and to end, that's that's the counterpart, I think, of the own light theory. Once once a country can find its its identity not in being more economically powerful than the other countries, 
And once its identity is recognized by all the other countries, it lets go its control or wanting to rule the world or own the world. It finds itself much more relaxed. <laughs> and I think this is the same kind of story. So for me, it, it when I say we can try it on a micro level to have a macro effect, I really meaning we have to discover this in our actual soul experience. This ultimate is what the micro level is that I experience in my soul the kind of things I'm trying to describe that that the light of my existence is I can find it and it can be recognized and once I do that I'm bound to recognize all other people and I'm bound to cooperate so that together the whole of our resources are possible the test ground for me for that is the way in the next um, I don't know what period of time to give but I think it's 10 years we need to give ourselves 10 years in the Anthroposophical Society to get ourselves sorted out on this in this way that I'm suggesting then I can relax about the historical side of it so I'm going to stop there um, I hope that has been some way understandable but also provocative so that we could have a good conversation Uh, thank you, Christopher. Yeah, could you please stop to share your screen? Yeah. And so we're moving to uh, questions and answers section of our meeting. So question, do you need do you need time to restore your voice? Maybe we can take a break for a minute or two, Christopher. Yes, yeah, fine by me. Fine with you. Okay, dear friends, two minutes. Two minutes just for sip of water and uh, stretching your limbs so we will be back in two minutes okay <clears throat> Okay, dear friends, uh, I think we are back and uh, we are ready for your questions. So do you know how to raise your electronic hand? So if you put your cursor or your arrow on reactions in the bottom of your screen and click on it, so it will be button raise, raise hand. Yeah, okay. Floor is open. Please don't be shy.
Could I suggest we start with clarification question? Yes, please. Okay, Leon Davis from Chicago. Leon, unmute your machine, please. Uh -huh. Leon disappeared. Andre, I have a question, but I don't know how to raise my hand. Okay, go ahead without it. Thank you. Um, Christopher, you said something about it. Sorry, I'll put myself on video. You yeah, said that with the evolution of economic life, the surpluses between the entities drove them to the next stage in the evolution, as I understood it. Their surpluses connected the entities to the point where then it became a, a proto world economy and then to who do those surpluses connect us with. Could you just please describe what um was what what you were meaning by that how did the surpluses connect the entities one to the other in that expansive way what what i was meaning was i think it's the kind of basic fact of life it begins with the human being um it, the economic nature of a human being is is when you're on the earth <clears throat> you create a surplus because in fact, you're not on the earth, you're in, but not of the earth. So if I put it very crudely, <clears throat> just by being a human being, you're generating a surplus because you will, you will bring more to the earth than is already there. I put it very simply. You, you can see this in any set of accounts. The set of accounts expects people to make a profit on operating. It's expecting a surplus out of the nature of being human without discussing more details about um, profit and so on. So I think there's a basic fact that um, a human being uh, generates a surplus, but primarily because the human being is never on his or her own. And you always have things you're going to have in surplus, and you're going to have to find that other people have got other things in surplus which you need. So it's a kind of, maybe a strange story, but the human being as such, in my understanding, is the cause of the surplus, is the origin of the surplus. And as long as you are with other human beings, which is the state of human life, you will always be led to trade with each other. You will always have more than you need and vice versa. And, and that, would just, that just works out for the whole of economic life. It's, it's ineluctable, um, the force of being a human being on Earth. That's what I'm meaning. So it, if you have a small group of human beings or a larger one, the problem will still be there or the phenomenon will still be there. And you can see that today, one of the most important phenomena today is the huge, huge, huge surpluses. They're in the form of financial markets, right? But, you know, when I watch Elon Musk's rocket blowing up the, the, today, the commentator said, oh, never mind. You know, but he was blowing up billions of dollars. <laughs> but, oh, never mind. So it's just part of modern life. We have huge surpluses. Um, the issue is always going to be how we treat them, what we do with them. And that is understandable. But the normal economic explanation is surplus that come from, from uh, trans moving things more cheaply than you did before, transa transaction cost saving. But even if you accept that, that's only caused by the fact of being human. <laughs> so um, is that clear, Kim? Or convincing uh yes thank you and it also reminds me of something that was said about employ if we don't keep expanding and connecting with other entities then we implode on ourselves something like this did i say that 
Um, I don't know if you said that or if it was something that someone else. No, I don't think I said that. That might be the case, but I don't think I said it. You didn't say that today. That's true. Yeah. No. The, but that... it's a similar phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I I think you if you if you achieve something, you have to be very careful; it doesn't collapse on you. So there is some entropic story there, but that's not one I'm telling. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't mean I don't think I mentioned it tonight. No, you so didn't. It's off, it's off topic. That's okay. Got it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Is next. Yeah, Christopher, um, assuming that the word that you used, which was uh, heretical, uh, sorry, her heretical, is the same as heuristic, uh, which I looked up, and I'm sure it is, um, the definition is uh, enabling someone to discover or learn something for themselves. And then the, the example is a hands-on or interactive heuristic approach to learning. Um, ah, but is, hang on. But I said you heuristical, not hu, not heuristic. Oh, is it a totally different word then? Yeah, heuristic is a kind of device for, to to enable you to educate someone. Okay. But I use the word heuristical. What is the legal form? You did, and I couldn't find it. I'll, the closest I could find on my when I looked it up was so. So I'd like to hear more about the meaning of that of the word that you did in fact use and how it connects up with. What you're talking uh, about. Meaning, how if if you want to to start an initiative, whatever it might be, including the Anthroposophical Society, um, how do you link that to the rights life where you find yourself? What what um, if you take an initiative and you haven't decided otherwise, you will be in. If, if you're in the United States, you'll be doing business on your own account. The IRS will open up an account for you as a single person. That's the minimum kind of juridical form. You have a legal person other than your private person. So that's the starting point. And then if you, you know, the, there are different ways you can work with other people, but these become legal forms, legal uh, companies, trusts, all sorts of things. That's what I'm referring to. And, you know, when you're born, you are a legal person naturally in the United States, I think is the language. But you can, if you start a company, that's also a legal person. It has a legal, and so that's the juridical side of it. And often, often there's a problem when someone starts initiative that the legal form they choose to to do to put their initiative in is not a fit for their initiative, mm -hmm. or in fact contradicts their initiative. So that's what that's the general thing I was talking about. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you very much uh, for organizing that uh, talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for Christopher to uh, give us uh, some uh, really good insights. I, of course, liked your approach uh, from the economics uh, view. I myself am an economist, so I have a very keen appreciation of uh, what you're uh, doing. And what I was... Uh, just very interesting to hear how you put the uh, Rudolf Steiner and uh, Keynes uh, together. I had the, the same questions uh, when I was reading recently a uh, biography uh, about Keynes by Carter, which is a, a very good insight uh, in in Keynes thinking. And I, I think what what we can learn from your presentation is that we need to have some kind of organic thinking in all those uh, forms and structures that we apply. And that's how I understand your proposal that uh, you have kind of uh, Russian dolls, um, so to say, that uh, are encapsulated uh, in, in larger structures. And if you can start to think about that kind of in an organic way that you have a world society uh, where uh, then the countries and the branches uh, find their way, and and that can be done in a in a conscious way. Then I, I think uh, we we have a, a structure for the for the future. And and uh, that, that was my 
understanding of uh, your channel principle and that requires of course this kind of organic thinking where one structure goes into another and maybe some principles are reflected on on different levels i myself have some questions about uh, yeah are, are we really a world society as an anthroposophical society um i don't know as economists we have a pretty good grip and understanding of world economy and we know the different parts of it uh, in in the anthroposophical society i don't know if we have this kind of understanding parts of the world are just not part in 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 the society in the same way as uh, the countries are in in the world economy so maybe there's some catching up to do and then to have the really awareness of of being a world um society is uh, another step where we probably need to train ourselves. I was just wondering if you have some comments on that issue. Thank you. Uh, in five words or less, I, I, I kind of, I thought you were sharing. I didn't, what, what do you have a particular comment, uh, topic I should comment on in your mind? You covered a lot of ground. Yeah, sorry, I, I was <laughs> trying to give you my impression, but uh, I would be interested in, in your view, how good are we as a as a worldwide society? Do we have a, a, a world awareness in our society? Ah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> yes and no. <laughs> um, to catch the chase, um, I we we would if the kind of things I was describing were to happen. So, for example, if if you if you look at sheer the sheer financing of the Gertianum, um, or or the society at the Gertianum, uh, in my image, um, the most healthy way that could happen is the country society say to the society at the Gertianum, "Tell us how much you need, and we'll go find it for you." And that would mean the country society, at least the councils of the country societies, would have to very quickly understand what's going on here. That because they're going to have to, I think this roughly it's it's in the region of well in the last couple of years it's in in the region of three point six million is needed by the Gertianum. We have forty thousand members, and that works out at ninety dollars a member. If every council of every society would send ninety dollars per member to the Gertianum. We have it covered. In fact, it does happen, but by a different distribution. So you have some societies send a lot more and some a lot less. But the average is actually spot on. Mm -hmm. But most councils don't have this image that they have an obligation to send $90 per member to the Gertianum. They tend to use what I call the Dario Fo principle. Can't pay, won't pay. <laughs> Dario Fo wrote this famous satirical play uh, with that name. And the attitude of many people is, I will pay what I can pay, and that's it. And I think this is a, I think this is grievous. I think it's, you know, ninety dollars. Uh, um, uh, no, what is it? If I think in the United States, for example, if you got up to three hundred and fifty dollars, three hundred sixty dollars, this is a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, nobody in the Amazon cannot afford a dollar a day. I just don't believe it. We just have a will problem. <clears throat> and if the councils were to say, okay, we will we will take this on, we will energize the will of our members, all they got all their members have got to do is find a dollar a day. It's it's even a nonsense that we have to have this discussion. <laughs> so fundamentally it's a will problem in my in my view. And my idea about in a country society, you do a similar thing with branches, is to find where you can get traction in a country society. Go and activate your branches so they Take on this story. How do you get every member in your branch to send a dollar a day? No one has not got a dollar a day. Just crazy. So we have a huge will problem. And um, if we can solve this, we will develop a worldwide awareness through the finances. But I think we have an illusion. If, if worldwide our finances are not in order, and they clearly aren't at the Gertianum, if you look at its dependency on foundations and all sorts of things, that's entirely because the members aren't sending their money in. And 
And so we have a kind of world image of ourselves, but it's not real because in fact, it's not backed up by our financial behavior. And so, so that will always be my answer. When, when collectively we underwrite the Gerti Arnhem, then we will actually have an experience of a worldwide society. Um, and I say that because so many people say, I'm not sending money because I like my society. I'm over here. The society is where I am and Gerti Arnhem is over there where it is. And that's its problem. So we have a lot of attitudes of this kind, which I was trying to touch on. And if you can find ownership of the Gertiana through this dynamics that I was trying to hint at, then that whole attitude just changes and you just go into a different mode. How can I walk my talk? How can I not just join the Amphisoft Society but make sure I've funded it? It's crazy that you could think you can join a club and let someone else pay your bill. This is, this is not the evolution of humanity that Rudolf Steiner had in mind. You wouldn't get away with it in the tennis club or the golf club. So for me, it's very simple. You know, if you join the Amphisoft Club, you should expect to contribute to its financing to the maximum you can possibly can. That's just a will matter. Um, and then you will have a real worldwide consciousness of it. Thank you very much. Um, Christopher, I have a question. I know your main interest, this is America, so English speaking world. <clears throat> with some problem of use of will of payment, but uh, according to prediction of Rudolf Steiner, uh, such a quality as altruism, uh, it's mostly gift of the East. And as soon as we expecting um, that economic, economic system will be formed as kind of form of socialism in the future, so uh, East is carrying uh, probably the main impulses for future economic system. Do you have any contemplations or experience of Eastern societies or what's going on in Russia or in India, China? Um, the answer to that is I've never been to those countries, um, so I can't comment about them. Um, my concerns would be uh, the power the English have in interfering in those countries' destiny, especially their future destinies. <laughs> this is where I'd be put my focus, especially as an Englishman, especially as an economist, how, how to kind of do differently to the way that I know the English behave in terms of karma of untruthfulness and these kind of stories. Um, but again, the way I would understand that anthroposophically is wherever you are in the world, you're in the consciousness soul period. And in that period, the, the, the kind of, we've, we've come down a sort of journey from the gods and we ended up in this, it's really at the time of Adam Smith, at the kind of Nadir point. And Adam Smith says, says, serve yourself. It's not quite what he says, but that's the story we get. Just serve yourself. Well, that is what you will be aware of at this point. I'm here, I'm the only thing here, the gods are gone. So I just serve myself. And he makes the image that if you do that, you know, all will be well. I think that's not true. It all will be well, because as we go forward, uh, we come into more kind of spirit self territory. And what we call altruism is actually our spirit self talking to us from the future. And this is why I put all the emphasis that will play out very differently in different countries. But it's critical in, in Anglo-Saxon world and Anglo-Saxon economics, if that's the driver of things. But it, it has also an image of itself that Adam Smith was talking about a very incompletely about a very immature stage in the evolution of the human being. We're 200 or more years on from that. And already you can see that the spirit self is animating people's behavior. You couldn't you wouldn't have the first concern about poor people or people who can't sleep if it wasn't your spirit self nudging you. And, and so I would start there because then how that plays out in different countries uh, will be very different, but it, it's also a direct challenge to the, the more serious problem of the English interference in the future of Russia, for example, or the manipulation of the Indian folk soul. So it just becomes a great um, uh, provider of software engineers, things of this kind, because that's what I see is going on. Or you can you know, you can put you can pass your dollars through the folk soul of Japan 
and what was calligraphy will become a photocopy industry. So, so I hope that's, you know, the only way I know of getting hold of the English <clears throat> is to is to rethink what Adam Smith said and show that has moved on in human history. And hopefully we'll then stop, we will stop meddling in people's destinies. I, you know, I don't know any other way to stop us doing it, actually. Um, mm. It's a huge story because yes. uh, we have this great technique of doing things and pretending and then pretending we're not the cause of anything. So we're not the cause of Gaza. You know, but absolutely we are. So, so how do we get inside inside this very? I don't know what it is, Anglo-Saxon English Brotherhood type story, Zionism and all the rest of it, and and just stop it in its tracks or just render it unimportant. Yeah, Believe thank it you. Or not, I'd, that's I'd what like I to just sorry finish my statement. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> because. We, we can see like a three groups of humanity. This is East, Center, and West. They contributing for um, social organism, very particular gifts. And uh, altruism, it's not type of behavior of, of the West. West coming uh, and contributing uh, cosmology or cosmism. This is the main, main I would say, instinct of uh, such group of people. Central Europeans, mm -hmm. the contributing impulse of freedom. But something what we are always concerned with, uh, this is altruism, ability to give, to give. It's coming from the East. So, so it's so important to engage and maybe see the model like Steiner did, uh, what's going on in the East? Because uh, according to his prediction, Towards the end of fifth cultural epoch, after maybe long struggling, so economic system will take form of proper form of socialism in the end. So this is a state. So I'm just you know uh, working hard. I'm studying one uh, one ninety one <laughs> course uh, of Deutschstein. So this is where it's coming. Okay, this this speaks a Russian in Chicago. I'm yeah. an Englishman in England. <laughs> All right, uh, Gordon. Next. Uh, John, I saw I saw your hand, John. Uh, so you will be next after. John's show. So yeah, don't well, now. So. Now or after Gordon? Uh, okay, let's go now. Gordon, can you wait just? Uh... <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, John. So I'm taking you back, Christopher. As an Englishman speaking from England, um, I'm taking you back to what you were saying about the lack of will in relation to, say, the Gertianum and its activities and the money it needs. <clears throat> I'm, I'm wondering, though, what is behind that lack of will? Because it seems to be a lack of recognition or appreciation of the value of what they're doing. So that seems to be a basis upon which people are making choices or they're not raising their awareness to what is being done. So then that is not going to unlock their uh, willingness to, to send money. Uh, but it does seem to be about recognition um, as the key to unlocking the will uh, and a recognition of the value of what is being done on our behalf, if you like, by the Goethe Arnhem. Is that a fair way to look at it? Um, it it's fair, but it's not the way I would look at it. <laughs> um, in, in that I don't have a theory about it, I just have my experience that, that I hear people talking like you did. You use the expression over there and them and i've never had that experience because in my whole my own biography i've always had a, a connection to the girl either by going there or there have been many times <clears throat> when i found myself in somewhat controversial situations <clears throat> and i've written to the foreshant to tell them before you hear it from anyone else this is what i'm doing mm -hmm. because i always had the image that 
in terms of the spiritual Gertianum, I'm part of it. And what I do is part of the Gertianum. So so my response to that is okay, well then if I do something which which may have consequences for the fourth chant, I better tell them and tell them first before the drum beats get to them and it's a different story. So I've never um I've never not felt I'm part of the Gertianum in the center of the spiritual Gertianum. It's it's a bit of a stretch for many people, but um I even think in that regard, we find ourselves as part of the leadership of the Gertianum, strictly speaking. And the more and the more we go forward, the more we become, in effect, colleagues with Rudolf Steiner, the more the kind of leadership is carried by those who do feel themselves as colleagues. And at that point, you don't have a them there uh, or over there relationship. You're in the spiritual Gertianum, and that's what I was trying to get at. Once you're in that place, you need a connection to the actual Gertianum, but it won't be a physical one. It won't be um, a distant one. And also it will be that when people say they want to, um, you know, they think they want to do in their own country before they can think about somewhere else. I say, that's fine. But what is it you want to do in your own country, which amounts to being of the Gertianum? So that's a valid thing to keep money back for. But all this um, imagery um, is it's not kind of necessary. When I ask who hasn't got a dollar a day to give to the Anthroposophical Movement worldwide, nobody. So when people start making excuses, I think either they've got, because I think it's an excuse, either they've got some misreading of the situation of what Steiner had in mind and how it actually can operate, or they've got some karmic problem. <clears throat> And as a treasurer, I've always had the view that um, I need to find out what the karmic problem is. If there's a sort of if there's a um, a knot in the money flow, and the way you find out what the karmic problem is, you go and engage with the person, and then usually you will come back to this image. In my experience, the image of the society was such they never thought they were part of the Gertianum, part of the spiritual Gertianum, because they have got some other image, but. But I never had this image. And then once you're part of the Gertianum, the spiritual Gertianum, you can only be interested in the rest of the spiritual Gertianum. And then if you're an active agent, you will want to make sure that's financed. Not that you necessarily have the money, but you will certainly make it your business to make sure the money is available somehow. So even if people say they don't have the money themselves, to me, that's not the point. You can go and bang on someone's door. And and you know get other people to fund the yeah. things that you personally don't have money for. It's just a matter of will. Um, and for me, that follows. If you're in the spiritual Gertianum, why would anybody else um, be funding it except the people in it? But not so out of their if, own. Yeah. If you, if you are, then <clears throat> you have this sense of mutuality because what you're describing here really is very rich in this sense of mutuality. And, and I think for many, many people that is lacking. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also how Steiner wished it to be seen and practiced in his own lifetime in 1923-24. But I think the, 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 the problem has been that very few people um, experience it like that and practice it in that way. Yeah. Experience that mutuality. And I, I would say in, in many different ways, but particularly, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have a, in terms of my image, uh, we have a, it's totally different because we have a, 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 the, the, the structure of the Amstel Society in Great Britain follows the political structure of Great Britain. We have a government in the centre of the country, which is not actually in the centre, it's in a particular part of the country, <laughs> and everything goes to the centre and comes out again. And it's similar with the ACE and GB. We don't have any serious branches in the way I was meaning. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of things, but we don't have a branch system. We don't have delegates. Um, we have quite a lot of resistance to that, in fact. Um, it would be very interesting to me to see if the image I had of a country society with branches could happen in the United Kingdom. It would be a huge challenge because historically we've never thought like that. And it would raise all sorts of questions. Does the centre need to be in London? This is disenfranchised. For people in, in the United Kingdom, this is also disenfranchising. But you have to go all the way to London to go to an AGM. This is hugely expensive. So, so 
so I'm fairly confident if we could think more in terms of branches, the centralizing of the United Kingdom would be a thing of the past. Um, you know, so so that's what I would say about the United Kingdom. It, its problems are caused by its chosen the political structure, which matches the centralized governance of the, of the United Kingdom and hasn't and hasn't gone in a kind of more Swiss confederal direction, and possibly would not. You, you know, mm. we're that, very proud you, of our. Yeah, that clarifies things quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. So now, Gordon. Yeah, okay, Christopher. Um, one uh, question for clarification and uh, maybe a couple of bogeys, a couple of proposed thoughts that can uh, can prompt some criticism or some uh, comment also. But first question, what in, in your diagram or model there of the showing the society currently, what are you including uh, in that? And don't answer yet. And, and so if, when I think about uh, changes, uh, uh, you know, contemplating changes generally, and I think uh, there's, it seems to me the changes can't be made piecemeal. They have to be like a multiple changes all at once. And uh, okay, another thought, when I think about uh, the society, the worldwide society, sometimes called the general society. Uh, I'm going to state a preference for thinking about it. Uh, and, and thinking about it, I think it, it would be only the individual members with zero real assets in, in, the, in that as an as a, uh, economic unit, let's say. And so the, uh, the only activity would be communications between members regarding the activities that, that in turn, of course, all need funding uh, economically. And, um, and uh, part of that thinking uh, related, I think, is that, of course, in the United States, we've developed a kind of tradition of, econ of democratic or distributed uh, philanthropy, where uh, you know, many people are appealed to and I think we come up against, in Europe, the tradition is more, and it may have changed, I, I have to give them credit for that, but I, I see a kind of thinking more that the funding will be provided from some central source, from the crown. And so we all, everybody engaged in activities feels entitled to funding coming from somewhere and do, doesn't have the practice where in the States uh, our uh, entities, let's say economic initiatives, like a Waldorf school, like a farm, like uh, whatever, ha has to uh, uh, appeal to the community in democratically, uh, just in a distributed way for funding and make their case and report their results, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't know, that's a lot bundled in there, but I, I, I put that forth just to prompt some comments from you. That's not fair, um, <laughs> but because, because I know I know there's a lot behind what you say. But I'm just wondering, in, um, when I was in, I was in, I went on a trip around the United States with Loreen, who's somewhere in this gallery, I think, and we went to Portland and uh, to the Portland branch, which is which is a very interesting branch to go to, because um, they I don't know what their story has has been in the past. But they are now in, they rent their premises from the Lutheran Church in, in Portland because it's cost effective for them to do so and avoids all the hassles of having to have their own building and all the complications that come with that. So it was a very interesting branch to go to because they've kind of got their, their cost burden very um, streamed down in the sense I think you're meaning it. So they deliberately didn't want to take on the costs of owning a building and all the risk and everything else and the competence you need to have to do that. So they rent somewhere from the Lutheran church and, and, their, and their books are quite nice because the burden they have as members is very light, rental, a few administrative things. And that's all they ask their branch members to pay for, plus whatever has to go to head office. So I, I think in your terms, that's an example of what I feel is healthy and what I think you think is healthy. 
But then we had the discussion. What if they, because they thought that, what if um, the Eurythmy troupe from Romania plus an orchestra of 50 people uh, was to come into Portland? Because they could sit there as a group of the Amstel Society and think that's really important to have happen. And we discussed that and said, well, you, you know, clearly you're the people who's, who is going to have this idea to bring a Eurythmy troupe into Portland, but there's no way you're going to be able to pull that off. That's a huge undertaking and it requires a lot of money and it requires a lot of professional skill for the find a venue and put such a thing on. So at that point, why would that be a, a cost of your branch? Surely you would do some arrangement where you might run the money for your branch, but you're going to, in, in the case of Portland, you're going to bang on the door of Nike to pay for all that. Surely. Because... Yeah. We, because as, as members, our economy in terms of what we can contribute, on the one hand, it has, we're not rich people. On the other hand, it's, it's all manageable if we don't start creating costs like bringing your rhythmic troop into Portland to be carried by 20 members of the Amphisoft Society. This is crazy. And so I think a, a bit of dis, distinguishing between what the society's costs are and what its members have to carry and what the society can carry on behalf of the school or these wider stories is really important. And Nike, I'm, I, I can't speak for Nike, but Nike, if they were minded to pay for the Eurythmy troupe coming in, they would join them, They want to make sure they weren't in the process paying the fees of all the local anthroposophists. That would come, that would comes with the territory. So that if we discipline ourselves to carry the costs that we're incurring, then I think we're placed to go to the wider world, wider than ourselves, for their support. But they absolutely won't come in. If, if, if Eurythmy is not in a public place, why would they do that? Not if it's going to be for 20 uh, anthroposophists to come and look at. That doesn't make sense. And they want to make sure they're not actually wiping out some, you know, paying the fees of 20 anthroposophists. And so my image there is, you know, People have heard me say a sort of siphon story. If we just get our flow of funding right to cover our costs, we will call into being a whole stream of funding, which will not be to our detriment. Um, but if we try and carry that huge stream ourselves, we just don't have the resources um, and we just don't have the competence. And, and in my experience, we refuse, um, I think in terms of England, if, if we try where we try and do this in London, uh, we fund a lot of cultural activity in London out of the basically other legacies of old members who die and luckily their apartment went up thanks to the market. But we do that because we won't go and discuss things with the Arts Council where the money really is. And the reason we don't do that in my direct experience is because we're ashamed of ourselves. We don't know how to negotiate. We don't know how to represent our work in the public domain. We only have our self-convincing arguments. And, and I speak out of experience of working with the Arts Council. So, so these, are, these are the kind of issues. If, if we get our own finances clear, and there's a big discussion about what belongs to the society, it will match the dollar a day that every member absolutely has, right? But, but not every member has got, or I would say hardly any member has got the resources to put on, say, parts of our, at the Gertianum. That's a hugely expensive operation to do that professionally. It's way beyond the means of the members. Um, so again, I think this, this, this difference or differentiation between what we can carry through our own resources and what we can carry in the society on behalf of something larger than ourselves, this is important. And, but we don't really have an active image that the society is also had this huge task to carry the, what I call carry the school. It's the, it's the legal vehicle for doing this. And most people do all that stuff through foundations. And in doing this, the society is lame because it's, its larger purpose is to carry the school. Um, and so if you do all that outside society, the society is actually lamed in its historical task. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying this because I think among the treasurers, if I may say this, because I know some treasurers might be listening, I think this is the kind of thing where we're making some headway. Um, getting this clear, even I mentioned the chart of accounts story. <laughs> and um, and I would say globally, as I said, with the 3.6 million, we actually achieve this worldwide, but the distribution is very skewed because some societies pay a lot more 
so we have a distribution problem. We don't have a problem of not having the money. And when we think we don't have the money, we delude ourselves, actually. We have a distribution problem. We're not aware of each other. And similarly with the treasurers, we have these nine guidelines. And the ninth one is so interesting. It's it's when you get a legacy, call up all the other treasurers. So this is not what it says, but this is the point. Call up all the other treasurers, tell them you've got a legacy, and ask where is the money best used. And when the treasurers, this is an image, when the treasurers see that, they hide all their assets immediately. <laughs> you know, because because they do, and because we do. So, you know, but if that guideline was made operative, it would be when when, you know, quite frankly, when someone sells their house at $3 million in London, that's not because of anything they did, that's just the market, right? We take that money and then we invent something to spend it on. It might be in, in Argentina, they're desperately in need of that money, but we don't ask that question. So in those little guidelines, they're very powerful, the guidelines, if you actually engage in them, and then you realize, oh, these imply a worldwide image first, and my contribution to that second. And the more that quietly happens, it, the whole situation become transformed. I'm a Leo. I sign bottom right, top left, uh, bottom left, top right. I'm an optimist. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola Graves Gregory. Nicola, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes. Can you? Oh, oh hi, Nicholas. Nicola. Your face is here. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. Okay. So um, I've got uh, three or four points or questions. So mm. first of all, it was, was just this uh, this question, you know, if you're saying, well, there's, there's all this surplus, and I'm thinking, yeah, well, there's also all this deficit and debt, right? So I'd just like a bit of clarification there. Um, then with respect to the anthroposophical society uh i'm yeah i mean that i <laughs> i'm more optimistic or, or or sanguine than you in this respect in that I, I i don't think it's um uh let me just lower my hand i've just seen something coming here lower hand yeah right um sorry this is nice okay it's cool yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I certainly think um, I, I have the sense of the I, um, I'm also a second chance person. Um, but I also think that there are, you know, the anthroposophical society isn't the only way through. Um, but uh, so that's so I think that there are a lot of other people waking up in different ways and I mean even my understanding of what Stein has said and I you know I have a much more limited knowledge of Steiner than probably everybody else here uh, but that his <clears throat> his view is that we do need it, it is the, the work of the individual it's how we work on ourselves that is key and then how we work together. I mean, as Harry Salman wrote a book recently about, um, yeah, the, the group as being the new, you know, as where we need to develop now, which also makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I'm a, a co-founder, well, I'm involved in organizing one work, and I'm, I'm a co-founder of a, a work, of a group which is, uh, it's based in Emerson College, and most of most of the members are members of the Anthroposophical Society of, uh, or the school, um, but not all of them. And for me, actually, that's that is important. We do have the sense of being an outreach group as well as being within you know, anthroposophy. Um, so that, I mean, that's just, so that's just a statement. Uh, but so, but I can talk about my own problem with the society uh which is of um the politics so for example i've been involved with a group the Korea cosmos robert powell which which does works i uh, does this beautiful um eurythmy which is steiner eurythmy of the planets and constellations 
uh, but they've been outcast um, because they still think that because they, they because they rate Stein, you know they they work from Steiner, but they also um, think that Valentin Tomberg was a, a good guy, and I, I don't have an opinion on that myself, but I do. Yeah, I, I think that the, the 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 politics within the society is a problem. I mean, that's a problem everywhere. I mean, I've got, I've got some friends who, well, actually, it was in Chicago. There was a, a friend of mine who who was a, a secretary of the Chicago Society quite a long time ago, but left because of the politics. But I've got a feeling it's probably different now. Um, anyway, so that's so that's just so the third thing was was something that you said that you don't think that there's a question of the periphery you don't see in terms of the periphery and center uh in fact Uli Hutter came over this was before the um panic demic and uh he was talking about he was saying he was actually talking about the sense that anthroposophy is growing in the periphery uh, you know, I mean, this is actually clear, you know, yeah, you know, that it is, and that it's not that it's it's dying in Europe. And so, I mean, you know, that's another. I mean, that's just putting that. That's just that, that was only what Oli Hertha was saying, and that's. I mean, from what I've heard, you know, about it, you know, knowing of people who are working in China and in India, and yes. So it seems to me that there is, um, that is something that's happening. So so we could go back to start at the beginning with a question about the surplus and deficits. <laughs> Please. Um, okay, well, maybe just that one, because um, in terms of the politics, I'm someone who's constantly waiting to have his balloon card called back from him, because <laughs> I think I live on the kind of edge for many anthroposophists. And um, so my experience is, is it, it's a very subtle relationship one has with the so-called Gertianum. And I can't speak about Robert Powell's relationship, but but um, yeah, I'm not sure it's politics that's there in the end. It might be, but anyway. Um, but for the for the debt question, I, you know, Steiner's image is, as an economist is fairly powerful. Already in, in 1905, I think, when he's talking to the workers in Berlin, he's talking about true price. And um, put very simply, if, if you need 100 to cover your future costs and you, t you accept 90 for cash, you're going to have to get the 10 from your credit card. So put very, very simply, if, if the true income you need is 100 and you accept less than that in cash, you're going to have to borrow the difference. And that's the beginning of debt. And so endemically, systemati systematically, systemically, paradigmatically, if you behave like that year on year on year on year, transaction contracts and without any exceptions, you will create a world in which there's hardly any money to buy things. Most of the money is in the form of debt just because you're not paying the true price. So that's Steiner's very, very powerful um, axe to modern economics. And <clears throat> I've given... You know, so it's it's simple. Uh, it's conceptually it's very simple. That is how debt is created by you borrowing money when you should have received it as revenue. So if people don't want to start with the true price story, they don't have a. From my understanding, from Steiner's point of view, they don't have any. You know, that's the only place you can start. Then then you have to walk your talk of true pricing. You have to make sure your revenue is never less than your expenses. You have to make sure you never under underpay someone when you hire them or when you buy something, because technically, when you do that, you're creating debt. It's not created by banks or anything. It's created by not paying people the right price in the first place. And if you add that up systematically forever, with no exceptions, you wouldn't be surprised at the level of debt that's currently in the world and the lack of purchasing power. Well, that's right. what I was saying, because you were saying, oh, there's all this surplus. And I'm thinking, yeah, but there's all this debt as well, which I, you know, I totally understand. Isn't it? But, but, so I didn't understand why you were just sort of talking about the surplus without talking about the debt as well. Well, because I, ch I didn't choose to talk about the debt. I, I was, <laughs> that was kind of in passing. Kim brought that up, as it were. But if you, if you look at the financial markets, you can make a very simple calculation, which is com completely unprovable, but it's not the point. If you add up 
uh, the amount of money in the financial markets. Nobody's able to do that. But I would say it's equal to the amount of capital people need to get on with their lives. So the best thing the financial markets could do would be empty themselves in the path of people's initiative. That's that involves spend out it involves, involves a lot of things, spend out foundations, changing central bank policy and so on. But but it's a very simple way. You can see the whole of humanity has created this huge surplus over the years. It's up there in the financial markets, going round and round and round, lending itself back in. It just needs to give itself back in. Um, and the problem would be solved, as it were. So so I see the financial markets just accumulated, humanity's accumulated surplus. Somehow it's got, you know, I, I often use this crazy image. I used to be a Flintstones fan, watching the Flintstones. And at the end of every Flintstones episode, Fred Flintstone put the cat out and the cat scurried back in and shut the door and the cat got back in and Fred Flintstone was left banging on the door, cut out of the story by the cat. And the financial markets are a bit like that. They've just huge accumulated surplus, which is now shut us out. And now it wants to lend itself back. It's like mm -hmm. taking all the blood out of someone and lend it, you know, renting it to him. We just have to have this kind of image and then find ways where the markets, for their own sake, quietly lower themselves, quietly enter themselves back into the real economy. <laughs> They'll have to do it. Either it will be done by a market correction or it will be done systematically. And and it's not complicated. You look at the amount of money Elon Rusk can, can command to just blow it up in front of our eyes. And so what? Buy another one. You know, it's not a lack of money. It's just we don't have an image that the financial markets have trapped all these surpluses and we haven't yet found, it's not true, there are ways this could be um, re-embedded in the real economy through through basically financing initiative in, in different ways. But I, I want to take exception to one thing you said. I simply do not understand that anyone can think the group is the future. You can't think that as an anthroposophist because the fundamental sociological law will actually say that is not the future. The future is the community recognizing the individual in the initiative he wants to take and financing it. That is very clear in Steiner's uh, fundamental sociological law. So if anyone thinks the future is the group, it's not possible. The future is the individual inspired by his spirit self, acting yeah. as a private individual in the name of humanity, not becoming part of a group. So I don't know what Salmons is thinking of, but a, a kind of group story is not my image of the future. It's not, you know, it, it could well happen, uh, but it's not the anthroposophical future. I, I think what he's saying is, you know, it's when two or more are gathered in, our, in my name. It's not just when one of us is gathered in your name. He may be saying, I haven't read his book, but but anything, I just, I just, I'm allergic to the idea the group will supplant, will supplant the it's not ethical... Supplant. The, the individual has to, yeah, the, the, individ, yeah. the individual work is primary, but we also have to, to work, you know, you know, I mean, which is what, I mean, in a way, it's what you, you know, I mean, all your not, dialogues were. were my, my image is every individual has to learn to act in the name of humanity. That's yeah. all we have to learn, and especially in our finances. Mm. And if we do that, that is where the future lies. And it will come down to putting our excess capital in the path of people who need capital. But those will be individual actions. There won't be uh, group actions. It's not possible. I, I, let me just clarify one thing. So when you're talking about the, the world economy, you're not talking about CBDC. What do you mean by that? Uh, oh, was it computer... Digital based currency. No, because by Steiner, my understanding was by Steiner, but also by others, is at the at the beginning of the twentieth century when the whole world economy began began, money became bookkeeping, and there is the only currency you need to think about is bookkeeping. So whether you you have your money in dollars or pounds or gold or whatever, it's all an irrelevance. The only form of money from nineteen twenty three onwards is bookkeeping meaning bookkeeping is your money. So whether people want to hold crypto or they play out, invent all sorts of other kind of currencies, I just say good luck. Um, 
in the end, it'll all have to be put through a bookkeeping system. And the only kind of money is there is your bookkeeping. So people don't kind of get this. This insight of Steiner's, it's, 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 it's hugely radical. Money is bookkeeping, bookkeeping is money, and that's it. Yeah. All the other things, the dollar is not money, CBDC is not money, none of these things are money, these are money as a thing. But by Steiner, money became bookkeeping, it's always been bookkeeping, but in the 20th century, it became the only currency in the world, the only currency we can share, bookkeeping. It's a technique which exists independently of whether we understand it or not. So this is this is fundamental. And all these people chasing currencies, they just need to study the idea that money is bookkeeping and bookkeeping is money. Yeah, this, it's, it's a question of whether it's it's total surveillance by the banks or not, which is if if they which is the idea yeah, of but, but if you, yeah, but if you if you think money is thinking, you'll walk into that world and it's kind of your fault because you thought money was a thing. I don't mind if the bank looks at my bookkeeping system. You know, I have to show it to the tax man anyway. So, you know, but all these problems are because people think money is a thing. They think they can hold it, hide it, do things and, you know, and they beget regulation. But bookkeeping does not beget regulation. There's nothing to regulate. You've either done your books correctly or you haven't. So no. that's a whole topic. But but um, don't go chasing after fake currencies because... It's not. It's not fake. It's not. This is. This isn't crypto. It's centralized digital currency. I know, I know. I know what you're referring to. But money by Steiner, money is bookkeeping, and that's for me. That as a concept, that's good enough. That means we can all do our accounts on the universal accounting system. We have a shared ledger. Just need to share our accounts. But but, but I think I, <laughs> maybe I, we shouldn't I, look into a debate here. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's two other people who want to, to come in now. So okay. yeah. Yeah, dear friends. Um can we move to Yaya, please? Uh Yaya. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh I only have a, a comment question and it refers to something that you said at the beginning of your presentation. You uh, quoted a, a sentence that said, We become what we think. And I oh, think yeah. that the whole the whole of your presentation explained what you mean, but I wonder whether we can perhaps expand it even further with the concept of altruism that Andrea uh, solicited uh, a, a, a short time ago. Because once we attempt to become what we really think, and by thinking, I don't just mean the dry thinking of an accountant. I think the the, the inspired thinking from the heart. Then, then we find the motivation to put that dollar in every day. And we find the motivation to expand our horizon beyond our uh, limited physical uh, horizon where, where we live. And, and we can actually become not just what we think, but we can become, we can give birth to the future, which is just waiting for us to take these steps. Have I misunderstood your presentation completely or? No, I, what, I was, what I was meaning is uh, when I say we become what we think, uh, I think that's the condition we now find ourselves in. So if, if we think we're a bunch of molecules, we will create a world based on us being molecules. That's all I was meaning. If we think we're angels, we will create a world based on angels. If we think the basic condition of the human being is generosity, but it's under-resourced, we will make sure we're resourced in our generosity. We're going to get the world we the out, born of our image because behind the, the, the end, time to get to the end of the 19th century, the gods have walked away. You're on your mm -hmm. own. And only Michael has any expectation you will succeed. But, uh, you know, you're going to have to prove him right. So so if you have a very limited image of yourself, if you have no self-identity, you don't intend to take initiative, um, you can't think for yourself, then you should expect the world to start thinking for you. Um, that's what I was meaning. I think it's the condition of our times on this 
so to speak, on this side of the threshold, life is what you make of it. And be very careful what your image of life is. That's all I was meaning. Thank you. It's, I would also say it's a secret known to economists and therefore they can cause havoc with this secret. They, they can interfere in that and they can create the world in their image. And there's not a lot you can do about that unless you wake up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Leon. Oh, you're back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I managed to cut yeah. myself off the whole thing. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted to get things started in a conversation, not to say anything particularly controversial or, or profound, but um, I want, we, we, uh, we met a long time ago in Forest Row and then again in the Philippines. And that's where I met Harry Salmon. So I want to say something that kind of uh, as my interpretation of what he's saying, because one of its books was called "Social: The Social World as Mystery School. And what you're saying about being uh, developing as an individual, as a human, you can't do in isolation. It is done in social interaction with other humans. Uh, it, and I think one of the things he's saying about group is that instead of sitting in front of a lecturer, we now need to, we'd be better off working in small groups. And, and that's all really. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know Harry Salmon's book or that, or, or his work generally, but <clears throat> if, I try, if I translate that into the image I was trying to share, if in the philosophical movement, we start to gather in branches of our country societies, um, that's a perfect, that's also known as a group. That's where you can meet with your fellow anthroposophists. This is a great weakness in the worldwide movement, the weakness of not meeting. Uh, but my image about groups has behind it, um, my image about the branches has behind it an opportunity for uh, members of the society to actively meet regularly together. So they, they, they tick the box of being in communication with each other and not being, say, hiding behind video screens or whatever else is going on these days. Um, so if that's what he's meaning, I, I don't have any issue with it. Um, yeah, a lot of us, like myself as a as a student, for instance, I, I'd go off and study on my own. I'd be in a library or something, but I'd be studying on my own. And and we, we're a bit like that. We're a kind of uh, studious group of people. We want to understand things. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, my, my, my image is the more anthroposophists meet in, you know, commune together, so to speak, the better. And if that's what he's no. meaning, uh, that's fine by me. Not just anthroposophists, though. The whole that's, social world. It's like, true of every human being. So yeah, it's understand. axiomatic. The human being alone on the planet is a complete illusion. So that for me is goes without saying. Even Robin Crusoe had a guy with him. Mm. I think we have a huge problem in the Amsoft movement. The branches are very weak. And and they're partly weak because they don't have any financial commitment to think about. My I will always bang that drum. Okay, dear friends, uh, so we are working already for two hours. Just and getting worried... started. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start again, right? Um, well, What's the rumor, uh, right? I believe it's like 10 p.m. in London or in, in Great Britain, so it's time for bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's your, what do you do normally, Andre? Say it again, please. What's your normal behavior on these Zooms? What is my normal behavior? I didn't establish any kind of behavior, so <laughs> I, th I think I think it's time to conclude our meeting. And uh, okay. 
say thank you to uh, to you, dear Christopher. Thank you so much for your super intense conversation and uh, super important presentation. So, dear friends, um, Christopher Stock and our uh, answers and questions they are recorded, so you can find it on our website probably in a couple of days. And um, yeah, and I'd like you invite, uh, I'd like to invite you uh, on uh, November 24th for presentation of Steve Usher from Texas, Austin. He is really a good speaker. So uh, unfortunately it's not good time for our British friends, but it's good for Australia and for South Africa. Oh no, not for South Africa, for New Zealand. For New Zealand. So, and now uh, please feel free and mute your machine and say thank you to Christopher and uh, and uh, I hope to see you soon online. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank Bye. You Thanks Bye. everyone. Bye. And thank you, Andre. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Hey, there's Bronco. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Thank Parker. you. <laughs> Bye. Hi, Bye. Lorraine. Hey, hey. <laughs> Hi. Some of you, small, some small of you know each other. We do. <laughs> yes. I also know Robert Powell, and so does Lorraine, and that's a whole other story. All right. Okay. I'm going to bed. Good night, Thanks, everyone. Christopher. Good idea. Good Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. You still there, Shani? No. Okay, I, good, I, I, I good night, friends. On. Good night.